Hi, I'm Brittany McManus with the Certified Collectibles Group. I'm here today with Mark Salzberg, the founder of the company. Thank you, Mark, for being here with us today. I'm excited to be here. We're here to discuss your journey in the world of collectibles and how CCG has come to be what it is today, the world's leading provider of expert and impartial grading services. How did you get started in collecting? So when I was a kid, um, probably seven or eight years old, I was on vacation, one of the few vacations we took, or I took. Um, we had a, I grew up on a chicken farm and we, we had nothing. But I was on vacation with my family, um, um, Oyster Bay, Long Island. And a little girl walked up to me on the street and handed me an Indian head penny, 1903 Indian head penny. I brought it home to my dad and I said, what is this? And he got me my first coin book. And from that moment on, I was just immersed in this world and so coins. Would you say that that was the moment when you knew collectibles would be your career? No, I had to go through the, the girls stage where I was, in, I was, I was into sports, I found girls, but I was, I was immediately enthralled um, and super passionate about coins. Uh, I worked at a coin shop when I was 11. Uh, and uh, that was fantastic because you really learn from the ground up uh, and you get to meet people. And I'm an 11 year old dealing in coins, you know, at a, at a coin shop. It was, it was great, uh, great experience. I started dealing in coins probably when I was 13, 14, 15, and I started making more than my uh, teachers in high school. So I kind of knew that this was my path, but I gave it a shot because um, my parents wanted me to go to school. So I went to Drexel and I stayed there for nine days. And I actually moved into a condo or apartment, you know, did the, the college thing for a while, you know, uh, smoked some stuff and did some things that you shouldn't be doing, <laughs> but um, had, had a good time for a couple months and then just jumped right into it. I bought and sold and I had a knack for it. And at that time, there was, um, there was no grading services, of course. There was, there was pre-certification. So it was dealer, dealer transaction. So you had to work hard, go and, and buy and sell. Um, and knowledge was everything. So I, was, I really wanted to concentrate on high-end material. And at that moment, I knew I was going to be in the coin business. And it was, I'm very, very lucky to have found it. How did you end up at NGC? So the person who hired me at the coin shop, John Albanese, um, he was a founder of PC Chess. We were, uh, you know, lifelong friends, kind of like brothers. And uh, he, um, he founded, along with David Hall and a couple others, PC Chess. And he decided to, we talked about him, you know, splitting off and forming NGC as com completely impartial. Uh, I was living in uh, Newport Beach and uh, I was a grader at, at PC Jess and I was buying and selling. Um, and he said, hey, I'm gonna move to New Jersey, back to New Jersey, and I'm gonna uh, open a grading service that's competitive to PC Jess. And so we talked about it for a while and um, I was living with my, my uh, girlfriend at the time. And, um, and then uh, we, we uh, found out that Andy, my son, was coming. So we decided to move to New Jersey and I joined NGC and became a shareholder, of, um, equity shareholder, right from day one, like a few months after it opened. Did you have any idea then that NGC would be as big as it is today? You know, the decision to, to leave the coin business was, was really a difficult one. But I saw this consolidation happening where um, really the best coins were winding up at PC Jess. Mm -hmm. and then they would go to auction. Uh, and I saw it was more and more difficult to buy coins in the marketplace, get them graded. Um, that was the easy part, getting them graded, and selling them was the easy part, it was finding them. Mm -hmm. So that consolidation, I could see that coming. And the other aspect of it was, I was, tr I was traveling 40 weekends a year, and I would not have stayed married. You know, it's just too difficult. Um, it, it, it was a strain, I think, uh, on, on everyone. Um, you know, every dealer goes through that. It's a lot of work, you know, you're traveling, it's tiring. And the security aspect of it was concerning. You need a lot of capital. 
So I decided, you know, it was a big move because 1988, January of 88, I joined the first, um, January 1st or so, and um, the market blew up. It went crazy in 89. So I'm sitting there grading while the market's zooming up, right? And I'm thinking, man, did I make a mistake? But it was the best move I ever made. Um, and then I started to see the consolidation as I had predicted. Uh, and then um, we, we, we just became more ingrained in um, certification became more ingrained. It was like, just this is the way it's gonna be. I was gonna ask you how you started to recognize that that third party certification could be applied to other collectibles besides just coins. Well, you know, you had, you had eBay at the time, right? And um, it was a wild west out there on eBay. Uh, and certified coins were certainly the least um, problematic for eBay. And we, we were starting to talk to eBay about uh, what, what other, other collectibles um, would be applicable to, for certification. So um, the comic book industry came to us in, uh, in 1998. And I happened to know Steve Eichenbaum from the family. We were, you know, kind of um, sort of related. And uh, I'd see him at family events and things like that. And we got talking. And he happened to have a background in licensing and marketing. And NGC was doing really, really well. I mean, the moment it opened, it was doing really, really well. I took over in 91. And now it's 1998. And we're just, you know, growing quickly and expanding and moving offices and growing. And I said to him, look, I need to bridge a gap between our world and the eBay world. And uh, he, he and I went to dinner. We made a deal. Uh, it's funny because um, I made the deal with him at dinner and it was great because I really needed help. And he had, he was my, you know, we became partners. It was like yin and yang. It was fantastic. And once I made the deal with him at dinner, he said, I'll take, I'll do this, but you can't make another deal with, again, with anyone. I guess I gave him too good of a deal. So, you know, <laughs> he didn't, <have> <laughs> he didn't want me. And it, and it worked out beautifully because, you know, I, I would see things and I would suggest things and I have all these ideas and he'd say, look, that's just not going to work. We can't, we don't have enough bandwidth with that or yeah, I'll make it happen. And he's terrific at executing and he's, he's been a great partner. Why did you decide to sell to Blackstone? It's a long, it's been a long road for me. You know, even though I'm relatively young, I mean, I started so young and basically I've been in the business since I was 11 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's almost 50 years. And we had, we had launched comic books. We had launched um, Paper Money Guarantee. We had launched NCS. We had offices in Shanghai, Munich, London, Hong Kong. You know, Sarasota's where have multiple locations. You know, the infrastructure is is something that is you know just took a lot, hundreds of people, and I was tired, and I I decided to start exploring it. And we we've been approached many 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 times, but if the timing was right, I wanted to, you know, take some chips off the table. I wanted to execute on my vision, and I wanted to keep the culture together. Yeah. And Blackstone fit that bill. I mean, we we talked to thirty or forty different sponsors, and they were just the right the right fit. Um, and you know, they're the best in the world, actually. So it, it it's it was quite an achievement to to pull that off. There's been a growing interest in collectibles from private equity firms like Blackstone and other major investors. Why do you think there's such an increased interest in the collectibles industry as a whole? Because it, you know, these were emerging asset classes, right? People used to joke, "Oh, you're in, you have a coin shop," you know. When I tell them I'm in the coin business, and and it's legitimate. These are legitimate assets now, and the reason is we have, we're mature. We have population reports. We have decades of prices realized uh, auction results. We have um, significant collections where people are putting real money into these things and we have registries. So these tools that we have built, that we have built over the years, have lent themselves to for people to feel comfortable, the transparency. Um, and, you know, these things are legitimately rare and beautiful. And as time goes on, you realize how many 
there actually are. So you can start becoming very competitive with people and then the registry is, is a, uh, a, a very powerful tool with that regard. So, you know, it, if you apply that across all the different verticals we've launched, it's, uh, it's proven and uh, people feel really comfortable with it. It's amazing that you had that vision so far ahead of everybody else having it. It's, an, it's incredible. Well, you know, it, it's, look, I, I had fantastic people as partners and, and surrounding me. And, you know, the things that I learned were, you know, put your ego away and listen. So, you know, the talent that we have at the Certified Collectibles Group is, is unbelievable, world class. And, you know, I'm there, they have my, my uh, gene, right? I mean, we, we, we are passionate collectors. We love the artifacts. We love the history. And, you know, we just are kind of geeks when it comes to that. So, you know, for me, it, it's sort of the business dictated where we're going to go, right? So it wasn't so much brilliance. It was just like, hey, you know, comic books needs to be certified and yeah. currency needs to be certified. So we just plugged in the same fundamentals and uh, the execution of it, the hard work of, of so many people. I mean, we've graded like, I think 75 million items and it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's remarkable. <laughs> it it's is remarkable. incredible. You have had an illustrious career. There's no doubt about that. Could you name a highlight or a few highlights from your career that really stand out to you? So, um, you know, I think one of, the, one of the greatest highlights for me was um, speaking at the Smithsonian and, 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 uh, and sponsoring the Legends of Numismatics, which was a model for the rest of uh, the Smithsonian, actually. So what they did with Legends of Numismatics is they asked us to select uh, the very, very best items, and then they put them on display at the castle. And millions of people viewed it. And then that model was used at, uh, for other uh, museums where they would take the very best and put them on display there. I spoke there. I remember my parents being there. Um, it was, I was very nervous, but, you know, that was a highlight. The other, you know, the other highlights um, I would think are, um, you know, I, I graded... Uh, 10 1933 20s i was asked to grade those and authenticate those with dave Kammeyer at knox at fort knox yes. uh that was pretty cool you know and the other there's a couple more highlights and those are building the teams that i talked about you know and i really love the people who work for certified collectibles group and um and just i'm i'm in awe of their talent you know like a david vagie or a matt nelson or matt quinn or dave Kammeyer. Or, or the late uh, David Lang, I could tell him, I could give him, uh, send him an email about uh, some idea I had, an article, and he would send it back to me in 15 minutes and make me sound like a genius. Yeah. And I love that guy. And then the other big highlight, I think, is having my son around. Yeah, I, I, you know, walking down the hallway and running into him, he runs NGC now, and it's a joy. It's just a joy. He's the best version of my, my wife and myself, and and I just love that kid. And uh, he's not a kid. He's a, he's a great young man. And he's just doing an excellent job. And so, you know, there's so many highlights. It's I you know, I could go on and on. I think that that's amazing. And all of those are really incredible. What do you know now about collecting that you wish you knew when you first started? Wow. If I if I knew if I knew back then what I didn't know. We, we might not have opened NGC. <laughs> John and I, we were snobs in a way because we really liked high-end material. So, you know, like if something came in, it was less than mint state. We'd be like, ugh, mm -hmm. you know, we just, ugh. But um, we had to learn. And over the years, you know, it's, you realize you, don't, you never know enough. You never know enough and you have to surround yourself with experts. And then we've branched down in the world and think about how difficult that is where you have a hundred different countries we're grading. It's a thousand years old, multiple metals, different mints. It's almost impossible. So we're incorporating AI and, and so forth. But, um, you know, what, uh, personally, personally, I would have, <laughs> I'm a pack rat, right? So I have too many things. I would have been more selective, I believe. Um, and the problem with that is if you buy uh, let's say a great artist, so I collect art, and you, and you, you think you bought his, uh, a great work, 
and then he evolves and it's, there's another work that's better, what do you do with the one you put on your wall? So you have to take that down and then you have to put them kind of in a closet. So, or you can give it to a friend. Yeah, yeah, no. So it, it's, um, it's one of those things that I don't know if it's wrong. I just think that if I could go back in time, I, I would probably be a little bit more selective. How do you, I mean, we know you love to collect. So when you are collecting coins, art, how is it that you decide what to buy? Yeah, I have a pretty good gut uh, feel for things. Like I, I can evaluate, I use the same kind of analysis I do on a coin for a painting, for example. So if I look at a painting and I, and I, I, I try to focus on, on a particular genre, and if something's weird to me, I mean, it's out. Like I just make the selection, like that's gone. And I get really, really great advice. You know, I would urge everyone to, if you know, get a great dealer, whether it's coins, comics, coin, whatever the vertical it is, really find a dealer that can help you because it's invaluable to navigate our world. Um, and I do that with art. I do that with ceramics. I do it with other things. I do it with, with ancient coins. I don't know ancient coins. I mean, I have a great feel for it, but I happen to have a great expert on staff that, you know, ha has guided me in the last uh, dozen years. So it's, it's, that's very, very important. And then um, I just have a feel what I want to be around uh, certain things. And, you know, I've indulged myself to, to collect not based on um, the best investment, you know, just based on what I love. Mm -hmm. And if you buy things you love, typically you do well. And if you have a, also a horizon, you can't buy something and think, okay, I'm going to flip this or whatever. I, I buy things that I'm, I think I'm going to hold for a while. That's why you're a pack rat. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Why is collecting so important to you? You know, it's my lifestyle. I, I love the everything about it. I, I love the, the, you know, going when I go on vacation, you know, we go to museums and you know, I'll go into a coin shop or I'll, I'll look at watches. or It's just beautiful to me. All of these things are beautiful. There's history behind it. And there's a passion that um, you, 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 you find when you're talking with other people that are, have similar, similar passions. And it's fun. Um, I just think these things are, I'm in awe of it. I have zero artistic ability. Yeah. And when I see, I see a great work of art, and I see it across the room and it hits me. I can remember the name, I can remember the dates, you know, and, and, and this whole numerical thing, you know, I know wine as well. Um, and I was buying and selling wine and uh, there's just that whole kind of, it's just a, my world, I just love it all. I know that you said that you collect the things that you love or feel good for you, but do you consider your collection to be an investment? And do you ever collect with that thought in mind, things that will be an investment for the future? I think you have to think about the investment aspect, especially the, you know, the kind of things that I have, I have now have gone up, you know, significantly, luckily. But um, yeah, there's, th that's the other aspect. You can't take the dealer out of me. You can't take the chicken farmer out of me. You know, I mean, <laughs> I have, uh, you know, once poor, never rich kind of thing, and uh, I really, I really think about it before I buy something. I look at the values, and it's easy, you know, easier today um, because of the internet and because of, you know, the tools that that we have. So yeah, you have to take that into account. And in, and I look at within, let's say, coins, for example. Um, I think ancients are incredible value, and so. Is I have like hundreds of Athena owls because I think they're undervalued. Is that a collectible or is that an investment? And um, I think it's more of an investment. Yeah. But I have s single forever ancients. I have a forever box of ancients that I hope to give to my daughter because she loves she loves uh, mythology and she loves um, she loves ancients. And those things are spectacular and. I don't like it's hard for me to part with these mm -hmm. great things I, I tell people when I sell a coin which I do rarely it's like ripping out an organ oh my so God. it's absurd it's an absurd thing but I'm, it's absurd to you but to other other collectors they know what I mean they absolutely do you guys have that gene yeah. that thing that just ties you all together what advice would you give to people who are just starting out in collectibles 
like I said, I, I think you should find a, a, an area that you is appealing to you, whether it's, let's say it's um, Civil War era coins or it's, you know, Golden Age comic books. Um, you know, find an area that, that appeals to you and learn as much as you possibly can. Get, a, get reference works. Go online and, and try to learn what you can and find the right dealer. We have vetted our dealers throughout the years, and that's another important aspect of what we do. Uh, and I think that finding the dealer and having a relationship with them gives you entree. You have to trust them. You have to, you have to not completely, you have to do your own work as well. But that's, that, to navigate that, that, that world is important. I wouldn't, the, the, the biggest mistake a new buyer or new collector makes is buying right away. Like you have to pump the brakes, take a breath, and just don't buy something for the sake of buying. You have to take your time. I know that this is going to be a hard question to answer, but if you had to pick one type of collectible that's your favorite to collect, what would it be? Uh, <laughs> so um, I, I love U.S. coins. I love coins, but U.S. coins, you know, is is if I want to think about something before I go to sleep, <laughs> I think I go, I go, I run through my box, you know, it's just, it's just, there's, these things are the, the way that I collect. I don't collect, um, by sets. Most people complete a set of barber halves or what have you. The way I collect, you know, I call them kind of freaks of nature and, um, things, things that shouldn't exist. So I have what I consider the finest, uh, you know, 1864 Quarter Eagle. I have uh, the, the, the finest 1863 seated dollar. I have the finest known of certain things that, you know, and I, I've seen it all. So when it kicks me in the stomach, you know, then I have, I try to acquire it. Um, you know, one of the things that is in my forever box, but it belongs to my son, um, is a, a 1877 S trade dollar. And I've told this story before. Uh, I was working in Miami for a dealer and uh, he had, he was a great collector as well. And he was showing me his coins and he showed me uh, this trade dollar. And literally I, I took my breath away. It was the finest silver coin I'd ever seen. And so um, he told me he bought it in 1976 or $4,000 while other gems were probably worth $400. It was called the coin for the longest time I've, I heard from John Danruther, and it was an extraordinary amount of money to pay for a silver coin, a, a trade dollar back then. So I said to him, how much do you want? And he said, it's not for sale. So I kept putting up maple leaves on the table. I had a, I had a bunch of gold, yeah. and I kept putting it on the table and putting it on the table. And I said, look, here's a bunch. I'll make you another promise. If I ever have a son, I'll give it to my son. And I had put enough gold on the table, and that pushed him over the edge. So I, I have that coin. I gave it to my son, Andy. You know, someday I'll probably try to trade him something for it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's in my box. It's in my forever box. And it is just like an angel painted it. It's, it's extraordinary quality. And underneath, the surfaces are perfect. And it's, it's a masterpiece. Um, so, you know, you know that I love U.S. coins. I also love... I also love ceramics. There's another thing that I collect. It's called uh, Martinware. It's ceramics that were made in the 1890s. Um, it's called Martin Brothers. Matter of fact, David Hall collected it as well. Yeah. And uh, I love that. It's kind of grotesque birds and, and various things. And it's, uh, it's hardly any of it survived. But I, have a, I've, I've, I buy it occasionally. But I have a really, really great collection of that. You know, it's, it makes me smile. Is there a collectible that you've always wanted to get your hands on that you've never been able to get your hands on? Uh, you know, I think um, there's certain artists that I have had my eye on over the years, and then, you know, they're just a little too much. Mm -hmm. One of them is Banksy. Yeah. Banksy's world famous. <laughs> so I had a shot at buying a Banksy for a couple hundred grand. And then it was like, nah. And then the next time I saw it, it was like 350. I'm like, nah. Next time I saw it, it's a million. And now they're 12 million, 15 million. And I, it, that's, that's, so I, I trust my gut 
But those are the times when, you know, I know I'll never get, get one. I'll out. never get it. Yeah, I get priced out. Wayne Tebow is a fantastic California artist, and that's gone too, you know. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the only limitation, really. Switching back over to the company, what would you say you want CCG's customers to know most about our company? I mean, for me, it's the, it's the people, right? I mean, we have a soul. We have a heart at, and it's based on the experts. I mean, you know, the ones I mentioned, uh, Andy Broom and, and Wes and, and uh, Matt Nelson and Sean and Kamire and David Vagey mm -hmm. and Rick Montgomery, who's my partner, you know, Keith Moon now, you know, Ben Wangle, Scott Schechter, who's the chief numismatist. These are people that care yeah. and they're brilliant. They are, brilliant and they're passionate and they're honest and they're, they care about the artifact, right? And they care long term. Because they're collectors too. Yeah, they're collectors too. So, you know, Steve and I have built these teams that we, that are the secret sauce. You can't, re, you can't, you know, that's our moat. That's, that's, that's what separates us from the competition and makes us proud. You know, it kind of dictates where we're going. And if we're going to launch a new collectible, a new vertical, you know, that is the, that's the blueprint we use. So we have to bring in the best. They can't have baggage. You know, um, they can't, they have to be, you know, fit that. And they stand out right away if they don't. Yeah. So, you know, and the, the people behind that, I mean, it's my spirituality. I know I talk about this and I have talked about it, but, you know, it's the, maybe the most proud thing I've ever done is, is built this company, you know, besides my children, you know, I'm so proud of them, but the people are wonderful. They work so hard um, and they care. And, and it's, I mean, it's a wonderful thing. When you're not working, mm -hmm. when you're not collecting incredible things, what is it that you like to do? How do you like to spend your time? Uh, so I like to uh, work out. I like to go fishing. I like to play golf a lot. Um, I like to smoke cigars. <laughs> I like to drink wine. <laughs> uh, I like to look at. Uh, I like to look at you know, beautiful things. You know, I'm I'm very very lucky, um, that uh, you know, relatively young. I just, that's another reason I pulled the trigger is that, you know, uh, I want to travel. We travel a lot, and um, I have a granddaughter, so I'm, you know, I think I think she moves to the top of the list of everything at this point. And so now that you are able to kind of step back from being so tied to your desk and so many daily duties, how is your golf handicap? <laughs> it's getting better. Um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm playing a little more tournaments and uh, probably a 10 handicap, and it's fine. It's like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's good enough to have fun. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. I can honestly say it's such an honor and a privilege to sit down here with you and discuss your illustrious career. We appreciate the dedication that you've given to this company and just to the collecting community in general. CCG wishes you the absolute best in this next chapter. We're so excited to see everything else that you do. Well, thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs>